Thank you, um, dear Professor Mazurenko. It's a big pleasure to be here. I remember Dennis was with us about, I think, 12 years ago in Vienna, 10 years ago, and we spent a lot of time together. He was doing cases with me for one year, I think, every day in the morning and in the evening, so it's good to see that you're so successful in Moscow, and we are very proud of you. Now, the topic that uh, Professor Mazurenko gave me is about orthotopic bladders. I'm going to speak slowly so uh, we get an idea. But before I do that, I would like to um, invite you to get more familiar with the European Association of Urology. And Professor Wieland is here as well, who's uh, obviously one of the faculties and one of the leaders in the European uh, urology field. The EAU is uh, extremely important for you because it's our academic institution, our academic home. Um, we have about roughly 25,000 members, and um, when you come to, uh, uh, to the EAU meetings and you know the AUA, they're basically similar adequately. About 15,000 people come to these meetings, and they're extremely successful. My job is that I'm, in, I'm the chairman of the regional office, so basically what we do is we, I'm basically in charge of Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Middle East, and this is an extremely challenging job. Russia will be a very important part of this endeavor. And what we're going to do is, and what I did actually this year since I took over, is to create regional meetings that are attractive for urologists in Eastern and Central Europe and actually give more power to uh, Eastern and Central Europe. So we just had the Central European meeting in Prague. Next year it will be in Krakow. And I know that a lot of my Russian colleagues will come. And then we have the Southeast meeting, which includes the Southeast European Balkan area, Middle East, and Caucasus, which will be actually in two weeks in Thessaloniki. Anyways, and what the regional office does, we have ESUT hands-on training, so you can come to these meetings and do laparoscopy hands-on training. You can do robotic hands-on training. We have ESU courses, country competitions, very fun. Every country sends in one young speaker, and then we have like the Eurovision Song Contest. You have one winner at the end. It's very fun. We have roundtables, step programs, fellowships. We give roughly about 150,000 euros worth of fellowship money to young colleagues per year, so you should come to that. And of course, everything that you publish there or the abstracts that you present there will be published in European Urology because I'm also in the scientific committee of the EAU, so I'll make sure that your abstracts get uh, published in European Urology, and at least in the supplements, and if they are good, also as papers. But let me go back to, um, to orthotopic bladders. Now, this being said, if you know the history of continent urinary diversion, it started over 100 years ago when Verhoeven, who was a Belgian uh, a Dutch surgeon, diverted urine to a segment of the ileum and the colon. And it was in 1911 when Zayer performed the first ileal conduit. He was not Mr. Bricker, as most of you think. In 1935, a German urologist, Zeifer, actually was a general surgeon, uh, performed the first yeunal conduit. And in 1950, Mr. Bricker came along, and obviously Americans always have the better, um, the better PR for them, um, a popularized ileal conduit. But obviously, it was not made in America. It was made in Europe before. So to all my American colleagues with Russian background, just to go home with the idea that, like yourself, not everything in America comes out of America, actually comes out of Europe. Um, and if you look at the history of ileal conduit, um, it was a very bright history, but there is a significant number of complications. I think today still it's the safest way and the quickest way of making a good ileal diversion. This is no doubt about it. If you don't have the tools, do ileal conduit. It's perfect. But if you want to go further and you want to strive for excellence, then you should think a little bit more. And excellence means that you should not have a stoma. Stoma is something that in many countries and many nationalities and ethnologies may be considered as a problem um, in terms of how patients perceive their body. In 1950, Mr. Gilchrist reported the first continent ileocecal diversion, and it was only in 1982, so not much time, long time ago, that uh, Niels Cook actually reintroduced the idea of continent urinary diversion and basically made the famous Cook pouch. Now, um, what the idea was be be behind the pouch is that when you create and you detubularize 
a lumen, a tube, and you basically um, sew it together after having detubularized it, you can increase the volume but also decrease um, the pressure. And the idea is really, the goal is to create a low pressure, high volume reservoir. This is the idea. You want it low volume and you want it big. Of course, not too big, but as big as possible. And the, I'm not a very smart physician but uh, in terms of physics, but all of you know the Laplace law, obviously having the geometric capacity in relation to volume, height, and specifically radius. So by detubularizing it, you can uh, keep the volume, you can keep the volume high and the pressure low. Now this being said, if you look at the evolution since 1950, in 1950 everything was ileal conduit. Then in 1980 came the continent cutaneous diversion made in Germany, like BMWs and Mercedes. In medicine it was continent cutaneous diversion. However, over time we saw that operating basically with the, with the colon is a problem. All of you know that do a lot of surgeries that complication on ileum, no big problem. But complication on colon, big problem. And that's why there was a try and a move towards using ileum for pouches. And this is obviously much better. This is again here also colon as you can see, but in general terms, um, ileum should be used. But what happened in Europe? And this is the analysis of the European Society of Oncologic Urology uh, that I'd be happy to be on board since the founding days uh, about 15 years ago. And if you look at that, you can see that the number of conduits is going down significantly. So you're doing less and less conduits. Roughly 30% of all diversions are conduits today. Another 10% are continent cutaneous diversions. This is Mainz pouch, for example. You can imagine. Heter it, it's called a heterotopic pouch. It's, it's a diversion continent to the skin. Um, this has not changed, and it's about 10%, mostly done in Germany, by the way, and in the U.S. So U.S. and Germany are the only ones who still do heterotopic pouches. What has been really, um, I would say, the booming experience in, 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 in neobladders, or I'm sorry, in, in diversion, has been the orthotopic bladders. Orthotopic bladders are really the Ferraris of, of, of diversion. And, and if you look at the history of only orthotopic diversion, actually it goes back much behind 19th century. Uh, it's in 18, 1888 when Tizzoni in Bologna did the first one in a dog. He actually did a neobladder in a dog. The dog died, but he saw that he could do it at least technically. Camille, who you all know very well in Paris, did actually apply that Tizzoni principle and called it not Camille bladder, but called it Tizzoni bladder and did the first neobladder orthotopic in, uh, in a man in 1957. Uh, basically, uh, it looked like this. You can see that here. And then it was Studer and Houtman that uh, these are the two fighters. You know, it's like Schumacher and I don't know who the other one was. Two fighters against each other. Studer, Houtman, Studer, Houtman, both around in 1984 fighting for, for, um, for succession of who is doing the best orthotopic bladder. And then in 1990, we also learned that you can do orthotopic bladders in women, that that's actually also doable. Now, why do we need orthotopic bladders? And maybe the message I want to give you today is we should do as much possible orthotopic reconstruction because it's a big difference for the patient. However, sometimes we believe it's too much. It's not that much for a patient, but uh, at least uh, technically seen, if you ask the patient, he likes it. It improves a little bit quality of life. But most importantly, uh, patients are happier because you don't have the problems with the stoma. And it basically, it's the natural way of voiding. It's to void in the urethra. So there is some confusion. There is some confusion with orthotopic bladders. Um, and we have some questions that we have to answer. The problems with orthotopic, the questions with orthotopic bladders are number one, which bowel segment should you use? Ilium, colon, iliocecal, yeunum stomach. What is the anti-reflux mechanism? Do we need anti-reflux for orthotopic bladders? What is the continence mechanism? What are the metabolic consequences? And of course, one of the most important oncological questions is, if you do an orthotopic bladder, 
what happens when you have urethral recurrence. In other words, is there urethral recurrence in patients who undergo cystectomy? First of all, let's look at morbidity and mortality. And I can tell you right away that orthotopic bladders have the same morbidity and the same mortality as ileal conduit. This is a nice study by my dear friend, John Stein, who died, unfortunately, way too early. I trained with him. I spent a year with him. And he was one of the finest surgeons I've ever seen in my life. God bless him in the other life because he was a great guy. This being said, John published a beautiful paper in 2001 in which he compared mortality and morbid morbidity between uh, orthotopics and ileal. And Manfred Wirt confirmed that in 2004 there was no difference. 1,000 patients, no difference in mortality, no difference in morbidity between conduit and continent diversion. So the question really is, is orthotopic bladder an appropriate diversion for every patient? Because most of our patients are locally advanced disease. And the answer is yes. Why? Because if you look at that, you can see that uh, besides lymph nodes, the problem of having organ confined, this local recurrence rate at organ confined disease is only 5%, which means that it's very, very low. And even if you have extravesical disease, local recurrence is only 10%. So maximum of local recurrence percentage that you have, the plateau, is 10%. <coughs> So in 90% of cases, you're doing the right decision. And this is as a follow-up of 10 years. Now, what about if you look at survival in these patients? And you can see nicely that if you have organ-confined disease at 10 years, it's 82%. If you have extravesical disease, it's 58%. And if you have positive lymph nodes, it's 34%. So obviously, the survival at 10 years is not that bad. This is for all grades obviously uh, involved here. Uh, this is just all together in one bag. Most importantly, what happens with these patients when they have local recurrence? Do you have to remove the pouch? So if you do a pouch and then you have local recurrence in the uretra, what do you have to do? Well, the answer is very simple. Um, this was a study of roughly 350 patients. Local recurrence was found in 43, so this is 12%. I told you it was 10% in the earlier study by John Stein and Manfred Wirth. And now this is another study by Richard Hautmann, published in 1999, showing 12%. And the interesting thing is, out of these 43 patients who had local recurrence, 40 kept their pouch. So you did not have, despite you have a local recurrence, you do not have to remove the pouch. So my conclusion is, even in patients who have local recurrence, um, you can still keep the pouch and do radiotherapy or whatever you want to do, but you don't lose the pouch. So actually, I believe that we can conclude that the pouch, it's safe in man, even with locally advanced disease. But we can identify risk factors in man and woman for local recurrence. And a nice study to uh, predict local recurrence in the urethra or after orthotopic bladder is this study by Freeman, who was... Uh, published in UCNA in 1994, and he found also a 10% urethral recurrence rate. So the urethral recurrence rate is 10%, and the risk factors for men is, of course, the typical risk factors, carcinoma in situ, multifocal tumors, bladder neck tumors, and prostate tumor involvement. But most important risk factor and strongest risk factor in terms of odds ratio was the presence in the pathology of stromal invasion. So when you do a cystectomy today, I did one yesterday in the morning before I went to Croatia. In the morning we did a case and it was very nice. Obviously, when he did a TURBT, uh, the urologist also did a TURP to get a specimen of the prostate. And in the prostate, there was a little TCC in the bladder neck. And the decision was not to make orthotopic bladder. I disagreed. We did the cystectomy, we did frozen sections, and the margins were negative. And we don't have the pathology yet, but unless there is stromal invasion, you can easily do an orthotopic bladder if the margins are negative. If the margins are negative. And I think that's an important message here 
that you need to do frozen sections and look at the frozen section. And if the frozen section is negative, you can even, with a little bit of bladder neck involvement, have a good result. In women, so it's important to do the frozen section. In women, it's a little bit different. In women, um, the risk factors for urethral recurrence are a little bit more complicated. And there are many studies looking at that. I'm not going to go into the detail, but I summarized the whole literature for you in one slide. The most important risk factor for urethral recurrence in women, and this is two main studies actually, pretty old, but always uh, the same data again and again, is bladder neck involvement. In men, it's not a problem, but in women, it is a problem, of course, because it's a short urethra. So bladder neck involvement and anterior uh, uh, vaginal wall involvement. Those two factors are predictors of recurrence in the urethra in women, which means if you have bladder neck tumors in a woman or anterior vaginal wall involvement, at least on computer tom on CT or on MRI, you should not do an orthotopic bladder in women. These are the risk factors in women, and they are totally different than in men. So what are the indications based on the Mainz School of Medicine? And Dr. Turov gave me these two slides. And you can see that the indications for orthotopic bladder substitution today, and I took the slide one-to-one -to, -one to, to tell you that it's not only my opinion, it's actually generally accepted. It's men under 75 years old. I mean, you can do a pouch in an 80-year-old man, but you could. It's feasible, it's doable, but you know, I don't think it's necessary. So age less than 75, motivated patient. This is one of the most important issues, motivated patients. Don't put it in a depressive patient who's not willing to do self-catheterization, etc. The sphincter must be competent. He should not be incontinent, and he should not have more than T4. So you can even do it in a T3 N1. I don't have a problem with T3 N1, but you should not do it in T4 or N2. The other contraindications, actually, for orthodopic are GFR of less than 50%. Malabsorption uh, syndrome after small bowel resection. Uretrectomy, if you need to uretrectomy, you cannot do an orthotopic bladder. If you have stress incontinence after previous prostate surgery, you shouldn't do an orthotopic bladder. If the patient is not able to do intermittent catheterization, because you all know 10% of patients will be hypercontinent in retention, they need catheterization. Pelvic irradiation. Now, this is a very tricky one that Dr. Turov mentioned. I don't agree because we also did surgery in patients with pelvic irradiation. It really depends on the radiation uh, schedule, on the radiation format. So I talk to the radiation oncologist and I say, was this radium? If it was radium, no. But if it's today's, for example, normal radiation, then it's not a problem. Um, is there any neurogenic lower urinary tract? paraplegia, MMC, Parkinson, these patients are not good candidate for orthotopic bladders. Now, this being said, let's look at the two famous contenders. It's like a fight between Studer and Houtman. Um, let's first start with Studer. Now, the Studer in your bladder he needs about 60 centimeters of ileum. I mean, you can do it with 40, but this is what Studer says. The distal 40 are used to do basically the pouch. So this is the whole pouch, and the distal 40 centimeters are used as a U to do the pouch. And then it's opened, anti-mesenteric, you all know that, then it's closed on the backside, it's folded up, this is very important, most of the doctors forget in a Studer pouch to do the folding. I don't believe in the folding, I don't fold personally. But if you want to do a right Studer, you have to fold the po pouch up. I don't believe in it, and we can discuss about this afterwards. Then the, uh, there is folded, then it's created, and you make a small opening in the caudal portion. You cannot make, uh, put uh, the bowel together and leave it open. You have to make an extra opening. This is the Studer technique. And then basically, you make the anastomosis. And this is how it looks like in real time. You have here the chimney, you have here the pouch, and basically you make your extra hole. This is something that many people forget, that if you want to do a Studer, this is how to do it. If you, I don't do a typical Studer, because I don't do that. The way I do it, I put the catheter here, and I close it 
over the catheter. So basically, I leave the opening, a natural opening, whereas Dr. Studer, he makes an extra opening. You can discuss about that, whether it's good or bad, but this is the Studer technique. And then you have your pouch, and then you close your pouch. I had a small video, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to show that to you. Anyways, what are the results? So Dr. Studer published the results of the Studer pouch, and whether you do a, a modified Studer or Studer, the results are the same. He published roughly 500 patients, 20 years follow-up, 93% were able to void, and 7% were in retention. So it's the true number. It's 10% retention. WHO says 13%. I always say the creator always has better results than the one who copy him. So I guess that's a normal um, evolution. Day-night continence, 9279. This is something you should always remember when you evaluate pouches. And you know there is a lot of pouches. Even I have my own pouch because Michael Marburger and I, we decided to do a S pouch. So we also have our pouch. Everybody has its own pouch. So this being said, you always have to, we call it DNC, day-night continence. And the DNC for Studer is 92.79, which is pretty good. And you remember that you're always better, more continent during the day than during the night. It's normal because during the night you have this unrestricted and uncontrolled uh, contractions of the bowel. Um, and a stomo uh, stricture rate at the ureteral level and stomosis, 2.7%. This is roughly for everybody, for Houtman, Studers, anything. Whenever you put a ureter into a bowel, this is what you get. 3% have strictures. Ureteral recurrence was 5%. He did a very good selection. And 5% uh, needed substitution with vitamin B12. What about Houtman? Houtman is different. So Houtman doesn't use the chimney for anti-reflux. Houtman believes in anti-reflux um, mechanisms. Remember the famous statement by Dr. Uh, How uh, Hohenfeldner, who said the biggest complications of anti-reflux uh, surgery is the fact that you do anti-reflux surgery. Because the problem with anti-reflux surgery is the stricture that you get of it, and you actually don't need it. Houtman is done like this, so you use a little bit more than Studer, 70 centimeters. Um, you do it in a V shape, and then you open it. So basically, it looks like this. It's like a V, and then you close it here. And then we can use today what those in Paris, in Paris, they use a Houtman pouch. They, they use the Abolenein technique, in which they use the opening between the two and put the ureters in here. Um, and then they put the ureters and just close the, f uh, close the pouch. And if you look at the results from Houtman, also published in the same year, 20 years follow-up. In the first 10 years, he did Leduc non-reflux, and now he does this tubular ileal segment like Houtman, like Studer. His DNC is also 95.82, 7% need catheterization. Stricture rate is higher. Why? Because he did anti-reflux at the beginning and recurrence rate was 1.5%. Then there are other pouches like the N pouch from Van Poppel is a more or less the same. The S pouch that we did in Vienna, I, when Dennis was in Vienna, I think he did a couple of S pouches with me. When he came back to Moscow, he forgot about it. But in those days, he had to do it. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of other pouches like John's, and I always put this slide for honor of John, is the T pouch. We don't use it anymore. It's way too complicated. Uh, it's based on the Monty procedure. Those of you who know what the Monty procedure is, this is what it is. You basically bring in an extra uh, tube and put it in between the U and, and basically use it as an anti-reflux mechanism. But it's basically not used anymore. And even if you go to USC today and Skinner is retired in the meantime, they don't do tea pouches anymore, except in very young men who are a dangerous having upper tract deterioration over time. In third, um, I can say that you can do this operation laparoscopically. Uh, this is a famous IRLC, uh, the International Registry of Laparoscopic Cystectomy, and you can see that today 52% can be done easily laparoscopically. Um, I think there is also possibility of robot. I, since I went to the U.S., became a little bit of a robotic surgeon, so I do a lot of robots. We can do it. Just to give you an idea, there is no difference so far between robot and open. So if you do it, do it, but it's not giving you much real substantial benefit. 
Um, there is high complication rate, so the, the learning curve is very important uh, and difficult. Um, there is complication rate up to 34% if you go by the Clavian stratification. Um, the survival rates are the same, so there is no oncological problems with robot uh, versus open. And finally, uh, some people thought that there are port site seeding, and this is not the case. Uh, it doesn't really happen. Um, and today, what, what is the standard in Europe, at least, is that uh, we take this Indian study and we basically think that you can do um, an orthotopic um, robotic operation with a financial incision. So we don't do uh, a midline incision, we do a financial, and it works pretty well. What about uh, the results of orthotopic bladders in terms of function? This is a very important looking at all studies published. And I'm putting everything together with you to make it very simple as a concluding slide at the end. Number one, patients who have orthotopic bladders void with the abdominal wall, most importantly, and a little bit by mass contraction of the non-detubularized segment of the pouch. Ileal reservoirs, so like Studer, Houtman, have more residual urine, so more residual urine, higher retention rate, but less incontinence. Colonic reservoirs have less retention but higher incontinence. So it makes sense that these two issues have to be taken into consideration. And the maximal pressures are somewhere between 20 and 28 cc's of water. What about um, overall continence rate? It's age dependent. Uh, in general, 10% of men need intermittent catheterization versus 25% of women. And uh, I think everything is always very difficult at the beginning, the, uh, the movie is out. When you compare ileal orthotopic to colonic uh, orthotopic, I think they are more or less the same except for the continence rate and the incontinence rate. So again, intestinal have more, uh, more retention, colonic have more incontinence. This is what you should always remember when you compare these two techniques. And you can also do very small um, uh, uh, bowels now. You don't need the big ones. Um, you don't need 60 centimeters of bowel. You can do it today with 40 centimeters as well. Um, and if you really compare the U of Studer and the S of Van Poppel, really there is no major difference between the U and the S. At the end of the day, they're more or less the same. So let's at the final part compare Studer and Houtman. Who is the winner? Who wins this um, contest? Well, to make a long story short, because I think we have a, a live surgery starting soon, um, in retention rate, there is no difference. In day-night continent, DNC, no difference. In stricture rate, you see a lot more with Houtman because they used anti-reflux. Lately, people do the Houtman procedure without anti-reflux. They use the abulenein technique, and there it's also the same. Recurrence rate, it's here five and one, but it's more or less the same. This was a, just a selection problem because uh, Studer used much more locally advanced patients uh, versus Houtman. Houtman only used in his initial studies patients with localized disease. In terms of um, any other complications, it's all the same. There is no difference between Studer and Houtman really in big terms. Also in terms of acidosis, pyelonephritis, it's all more or less the same. Um, one of the very nice studies that I like and you should read, it's a couple of years ago, it was published. Um, it, I think it came out in 2011. In 2010 it was on the PubMed, but it came out in 2011. Is you can really, when, you, when you're very, very eloquent and smart, you can even do um, pouches using only 35 centimeters, 30 centimeters of ileum. You don't need to go for 60 centimeters. Um, that's not necessary. And you can see that that works pretty well. This is SP, the short pouch. LP, the long pouch, and it's the same results. This, this group used 30 centimeters, they used 60 centimeters, and you more or less have the same results. Um, so what are my conclusions? Well, the conclusions are the WHO consensus conclusions. Number one, we do a lot, a lot of, of, of pouches today and, and, and cystectomies, and looking at over 7,000 patients in the WHO consensus that they had the privilege to be part of, um, 50% of patients have orthotopic bladders today. So this is something we should understand. It's a growing number of patients asking for orthotopic bladders. One third are undergoing ileal conduit. 
and 10% only have this heterotopic or anal uh, uh, diversion mines pouch. There are no randomized trials on quality of life. So if somebody tells you that something is better than the other because of quality of life, it's not true. I think um, you don't need to do an anti-reflux for the ureter, except if you use the colon. In the pouch, I think that the cock pouch, of course, is out. You should use either Studer or Houtman or a mixed, we call it a Stutman, a mix of both. Um, and you definitely do not need anti-reflux for a notary pouch. And the only study that I'm aware of on, on, on quality of life is that actually there is no difference between ileal conduit and orthotopic bladders. This is very funny because doctors always think that orthotopic bladder is better for the patient in terms of quality of life. Well, the truth is, if you ask the patient, it's not true. The patient has the same apprehension of quality of life. Uh, and so um, the conclusion really are which diversion for which patient. It's an individual decision. There's patient criteria and medical criteria. The patient criteria are the preference of the patient. So you tell the patient what he wants. Age and morbidity, motivation. He has to be able to do the catheterization. Etiology, of course, if you have uh, 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 squamous cell carcinoma, maybe doing an orthotopic bladder is not good. And of course, the indications. Um, what are the medical criteria? Well, if you have upper tract problems, GFR less than 50, grade three hydronephrosis, two is not a problem. One or two hydronephrosis is not a problem. But if you have grade three hydronephrosis or recurrent pyelonephritis, do not do anal diversions. Do incontinent diversions, this is very important. If you have GI tract problems, any problem, you shouldn't do a continent diversion and you shouldn't do an anal diversion. If you have urethral problems, because you have a urethrectomy that you did, an incompetent sphincter, irradiation or neurogenic problems, you shouldn't do an orthotopic bladder. And finally, um, if CIC is a problem, so if the patient cannot do intermittent carization, you should not do any kind of continent diversion. This being said, uh, I always finish with Willard Goodwin's statement that um, to make a long story short, the pouch, the best pouch for your patient, you have to decide. You make your own pouch. Don't copy a pouch. Do what you do best, and if you do something good, that's the best uh, pouch for your patient. I think this is the important message out there. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Diet Coke, so I put you my favorite pouch, of course, would be a Coke pouch. But at the end of the day, I think the decision is between the patient and you. Don't copy Studer, don't copy Houtman, don't copy us or whoever. You make the decision what is the best pouch for your patient. Thank you very much.